Hello and welcome to the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and fearless feminine voices disrupting our society. Today is March 14th, 2022. Here is the Feisty News for Women in World Affairs. It is day 18 of the Russian war against Ukraine. On February 24th, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in order to overtake the capital city and claim it as its own territory. Since then, at least 2 million Ukraine citizens have fled the war zone, while tens of thousands of Russians are fleeing their country. Russia recently launched a barrage of airstrikes on a military base in western Ukraine, bringing the war 11 miles from the border with Poland where NATO forces are stationed on high alert. An American journalist was killed while reporting in a Kyiv suburb, and Russia asked China for military and economic aid for the war. The tension is mounting as we watch this terrible saga unfold. In previous episodes of The Feisty, we spoke with three women from Ukraine who managed to escape the war zone, and many women, like myself, wonder if the war could ever reach our doorsteps, and if it did, what would we do? Is there any way to prepare for such a catastrophe? Thankfully, we have help. Jesse Krebs, a former Air Force SEER instructor who now teaches women how to survive through a program called OWLS, Outdoorsy Women's Survival Skills, has joined us today. Jesse, thank you so much for showing up to empower women. Look, what can we learn today that will allow us to be leaders just in case the war expands? Thank you so much, Tierica. I really appreciate it. And I'm so happy to be on the, the Feisty today. Thanks for inviting me on. It's an honor. So yes, my background, I am a former Air Force SEER instructor, which stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. Basically teaching our air crew members, anybody in the military, what to do if their plane comes down behind enemy lines and how to get out of the situation, hopefully safely and back home. So that's my main mission or was my mission in the military. And now I run a survival school, uh, one that caters to teaching women owl skills, outdoorsy women learning survival skills. And so, yeah, we don't want to end up in a similar situation um, to what folks are going, going through over there and not knowing where our relatives are and not knowing if they're safe and try to get out of those situations safely. So ahead of time, especially if you have people in your household or nearby as your neighbors, people you love and care about, having plans of what you're going to do if something happens, right? And this doesn't have to just be an invasion. This can be if um, you've got a fire ripping through the neighborhood or um, there's floods or earthquake or anything like that. It's good to have evacuation plans. So having some kind of a bag that you can simply grab and go is really good. That just has essential things that are going to work for your area and make sure, you know, basic survival stuff, not just having the gear, but also the skills that go along with that. And that's not necessarily what you learn in watching TV shows or Hollywood. A lot of the things that are shown in there aren't actually realistic. So make sure, you know, the real stuff by taking actually some training would be good, um, or at least uh, trying to find a, a good source of real information that can help you learn those things. And I would basically try to do some things ahead of time, such as get out a map. That's a big part and know your cardinal directions and have certain locations that everybody's familiar with. And especially if you give those like locations code names, like maybe your daughter, when she was growing up, there was a favorite park that's a few blocks away and you call it Elmer Park, right? Maybe that's not the name of it. She just, she played with her Elmo doll there a lot. So she's got, you've got Elmer Park. So Elmer Park is one of your destinations, and maybe there's a small tree or some brush in the back that you can go into and be hidden, and that's your first, your primary one that you're, you're going to get to. So that's your first location that you're going to try to rally and get everybody to. Great. So now everybody needs to have at least, I would give three different routes on how to get there. So if you're going to tell your daughter, all your relatives, hey, we're going to meet at Elmer, right? They don't, that's all they need to know, and now, now they know what you're talking about. And they all have different, they've all chosen from wherever they are, three different routes to get to that location. 
and they name those routes, right? You could just do one, two, three, but you can say, take the shady route, take the blue route, whatever it is. And that's how we're going to try to get there. And everybody knows how to get that, to that location, right? And now everyone can do that without letting the enemy know, right? Either through cell phones or if you're using radios, if you're passing notes, however that communication happens, everybody knows what you're talking about, right? In your small group. And that's your first rally point. If that one's compromised, people, you start to go there and you're like, oh boy, this isn't going to work. You can literally get on the phone or text if all that is still working and have a second backup point and have it a completely different direction if possible, right? So maybe Elmer Park was Northeast and now you're going to go South to get to um, the gold ride, whatever that is, right? Maybe it's someplace by a by a station or something that you've, you've gone on before. So these are just techniques and ways that we can look at a map and we can come to a consensus as a group and say, this is what we're going to do. And these are our code names and make sure you review it. Maybe once every three months or so send out, Hey, here's a message to, again to people that this is, this is the guideline. If anything happens, anything goes down and also have a rally point. That's way outside the city, outside of any potential hotspots have a primary and a backup. So you've got a, a cabin, right? Someplace that you can get to that's maybe two hour drive outside the city. And that can be a rally point. And if that one's compromised, again, going maybe a different direction, um, there's a secondary rally point. If people get to the cabin or start getting near it and there's lots of activity and lots of people around and vehicles say, never mind, we're going to the, the final, the last one, which is our alternative backup point. So these are techniques to do to literally get yourself out of the area. Before you go, consolidate everything, have it, have everything good to go. And throughout this entire process, breathe, just breathe and allow yourself to feel fear. It's going to come up. Let yourself feel it fully and it'll pass in a few minutes. Make sure you do that before you make any decision. Decisions made when we're in panic mode, when we're in fear mode are not good decisions. <laughs> So make sure you're staying centered and grounded. If you're coming from a calm place, your decisions are going to be much more effective and you're a lot more, you're a lot, lot more likely to keep your family alive, right? So um, make sure you do that. Just, just breathe. You know, death is not the enemy. We're all going to die eventually. So make peace with that, that you and some of your family members, some of your loved, loved ones may die during this. And you fretting about it, worrying about it, stressing about it, thinking about it, letting that fear overwhelm you doesn't serve them or you. So make sure you feel it and then let it go and make decisions with a cool, calm head. And that's how you'll get out of the situation, hopefully more or less intact. Wow. Now I kind of know what to plan for. I wasn't expecting the three location suggestions for meetup points with our families, but that's a good idea. I got it. Earlier, you said that we need to learn some basic survival skills. Well, what basic survival skills do we need to know? There are five basic needs that I talk about in most situations, and one of them is signaling and communication. So we'll talk about that, right? Going backwards, we'll talk about that and how to communicate with each other. Another really critical one, I think, for this type of scenario in particular is navigation skills. So many of us are dependent now on GPS and using our phone and looking up Google Maps to go where we want to go. And if that system is compromised, if it's shut down, right, and especially if the enemy can use your phone to track you, you don't want to have that phone on. So knowing how to use a map and compass and how to get from point A to point B safely, plan routes, do those types of things, that's really important for you and your fam family members to know if you're going to evacuate and get out of a situation. So I think those are really critical. Hmm, then decisions, decisions. There's a couple, there's a couple more. Personal protection, which isn't so much about how do I defend myself, but more about thermal regulation. What kills most people out there is exposure of some kind or um, things falling or them falling off cliffs and things. So knowing how to move is important, but also how do I thermally regulate? How do I have the right clothing and improve on the clothing that I have to keep myself warm or cool and basically thermally um, stabilized? That's really important. Uh, and another one is water. A lot of people focus on food we can go a long time without food. So food is not really actually all that important. And at least in the short term, water is way, way more important. 
And many people have died or killed, unfortunately, I'm sure their children or people they loved by feeding them when they didn't have water available. It takes a lot of water to digest our food. So if you're feeding someone without giving them water, you're dehydrating them faster and you will kill them faster. We can only go about three days without water. We can go 30 plus days without food. So if you don't have a water source available, don't eat. If you don't have a water source available, it's hard to see your kids go hungry. You do not give them food if they don't have water or you're going to kill them quicker. Okay. So water is critical. So having some kind of a filtration device or something that can disinfect water, which can just be grab a a thing of bleach off your, out of the laundry, right? Before you leave and just put one or two drops in a liter of water and leave it for about 30 minutes before you drink it. Um, So things like that can really be effective and helpful and bring water containers and containers that you can boil water in, right? Literally that can just be a pot that you grab off the stove and a lid, right? Throw it in a backpack and go preferably use backpacks. Don't use, um, you know, anything like suitcases or rollers. Those are way too hard to work with if you're trying to walk around the woods. So having something that you can actually contain everything in and walk comfortably um, while keeping your hands free and be able to wrangle your wrangle your kids or your loved ones, you know, elderly, whoever you have around you and be able to, um, to be more effective. Those are a few tips. There's a lot more, but that'll be some at least. Thank you, Jesse, so much for giving us the knowledge to plan ahead for the worst case scenario. You can learn more survival skills from Jesse by visiting www.alskills.com. Thanks again, Jesse. In other news, according to an article in the news.com, official data and studies have revealed that nearly five out of 10 people in Pakistan live in multidimensional poverty. The country also has a high proportion of the poor experiencing severe poverty. For every 1,000 babies born in Pakistan in 2019, 67 died before their fifth birthday. Although poverty is not prevalent across the entire country, activist Shireen Najib decided to create a support system for those she came across who were in need, despite being in need herself. Shireen, an author, activist, and social influencer in Islamabad, Pakistan, managed to personally raise more than $54,000 to relieve the pressures of poverty for those she came into contact with. Welcome to the Feisty, Shireen. I am so glad to meet you. In addition to raising funds for your neighbors living in poverty, can you describe the work you are doing to enrich your community? First of all, I would like to thank you uh, to Erica for inviting me over and I'm really honored to be here. Um, It's a great uh, privilege to be here on your Feisty show, uh, news uh, channel. So uh, basically the poverty line is, uh, I would connect it with the illiteracy line, which is around 61% in Pakistan, which is a huge amount, you know? Um, But I will also say uh, along with this, that uh, the level at the scale at which the illiteracy level is being improved is is among the fastest in the region. And a lot of uh, schools have sprung up and every person I meet in my uh, socioeconomic level, I find people who are opening schools for the underprivileged people. So um, yes, there is a lot of poverty in our country, but it is uh, let's say at a better scale than the neighboring countries. And uh, our people are, you know, even the most poor one will be having a little mobile phone. Uh, they will be having a television uh, nearby or in their home. Or, you know, there's different levels of poverty. And uh, we are like, I like to help people who are right at the grassroots level. And uh, so I keep saying that I have a very high standard. Because I feel that when if somebody is trusting me with their money, I want to personally be in contact with a person who is genuinely in need of it. And, uh, you know, uh, he's not going to squander that money uh, on useless items. So, in fact, I don't give cash as such. I get things and then give it to the person, which ensures that whoever gets the thing, uh, the stuff which I get from the money, which I uh, get donated, is I make sure that it goes into exactly for which I'm uh, giving it to the person. For instance, um, 
when the COVID began, I started the food drive and I was very worried about the daily wage uh, persons because everything had stopped, all the shops had closed, all the work had stopped. And so one wondered how the next meal would come for the poor people. So two years ago, around the 23rd of March, I sort of just gave food to, I just like went out. I just saw these people in the rain and I came to the nearest restaurant in my house, uh, near my house. And I said, please pack uh, whatever money I had in my wallet. I gave it to him and he's, he had enough. He made food for 20 people. So when I told him to make it for 20 different packets, the person was interested to know why. I said, well, I'm going to give it to different people. It's not for one party of 20 people. So he said, okay, put five from my side. And so we were able to give food to 25 people in that rainy evening on 23rd March, 2020. And that day onwards till today, the food giving has not stopped. And now we are giving hundreds of people food on a daily basis. It's so exciting that when my daughter heard it, she said, okay, tomorrow it will be from my side. My mother heard, she said, okay, tomorrow it will be from my side. And then we just shared it in my Instagram. And so the story went on. So from that day on, we have been feeding like even up to 600 people a day. And this has been very exciting. Um, with that, I had already been doing this that I used to help with people in uh, marriages. And so I was doing that and some medical cases. I would select one or two, like we helped a little nine-year-old girl with um, uh, getting a heart operation. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been able to get it done. Mm -hmm. So it was really exciting. And then we got prosthesis for two, two men uh, who had lost their arms. Now we are gathering funds. We have already gathered uh, funds for getting legs, prosthesis legs for a woman who lost her legs because of uh, sugar. I never knew that diabe the diabetes could be so horrifying. So, you know, that's how it is. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing, Shireen. As we take a look at the leaders in our society, I challenge you to compare them to this woman, who I believe is a primary example of what leadership should be. She recognized a problem in her community and she went to work to correct it without being asked to do it, elected to do it, or paid to do it. This is the sincerest form of leadership. Shireen is the true definition of feisty. In other news, a Georgia man was sentenced to two life prison sentences earlier this week for sexually assaulting three generations of the same family in Cobb County. 66-year-old Benny Frank Johnson was accused of multiple sexual assaults against a girl who was eight years old at the time. During the course of the police investigation, the victim's mother told police that she had also been abused by the defendant when she was a child. And during his recent trial, another witness also testified that she had been raped by Johnson when she was a child. That witness identified herself as Johnson's former stepdaughter, saying he was previously married to her mother, according to Atlanta-based Fox affiliate WAGA. Beanie Frank Johnson is now in jail, but we need to talk about how this happens. How does the same man get to rape his stepdaughter, another relative, and her daughter too? It's called protecting the abuser. Why do we do this? We may do this in part because we feel shame that we somehow allowed it to happen. Or maybe we don't say anything because we believe we won't be believe, believed. Or maybe we don't speak up because in so many cases of abuse, the abuser is not a stranger pulling us into an alley. It's someone we love. When we hear on the news that an abuser groomed his victim, what they're really saying grooming is, the abuser was loving them and gaining the trust of the victim. For someone to first give us the love we need and then turn around and hurt us, it's mentally confusing. We don't wanna hurt them because we love them and then we don't wanna be the one everyone blames for turning the family upside down if that person goes to jail. We don't wanna disrupt the family. We want things to go back to normal before the abuse started. We want to forget. We want the abuse to stop, but we don't want to hurt anyone else in the process. So we blame ourselves and remain silent. But we are the ones carrying the pain and we unknowingly pass it on to others, even when we're trying to protect them from harm. Our silence isn't protecting us from harm. We're still hurting. 
Our silence isn't protecting our family from harm because the abuser will do it again to another family member. Our silence is hurting everyone. We unwillingly become a part of the abusive cycle when we don't speak up, when we don't disrupt. This is the fight, see, damn it. We have to disrupt. We have to learn to speak up and say stop. Just like the tr disgusting tradition of female genital mutilation happening all around the world, where women are presenting their daughters to be permanently disfigured in the name of tradition when they themselves hated that it was done to them. We have to speak up and say stop. We have to be disruptive. We have to give ourselves permission to f up the whole damn family if we're being abused by someone who claims to love us. In 2014, long before the Me Too movement, I created a website called abuseisnotasecret.com, which allows people who have been abused and had no one to tell to submit their stories to be shared publicly and be heard. Even if you can't say it out loud, you can write it down. You should do something because if you don't, your daughter will be next. We have to disrupt. We have to disrupt. It's okay to disrupt. It's time for a break. Well, why did Kim Kardashian tell women who in business that they need to get their ass up and work? <laughs> and what happens when you lose over and over again in life? The answer to those questions and more right after the break. Hi, I'm Angelica Maria Chesimoa, founder of Omakwa, and I have a very important message to share with you. What you've been told about self-care is wrong. Now, I learned the truth about self-care when last year I went through a three-month-long depressive episode. It was difficult, and none of the typical things you hear about self-care, like affirmations, nights in, spa days, none of that was working for me. But I learned that there are three main pillars to self-care that I use to bring myself out of it, and that's your body, your mind, and your spirit. So with this in mind, I created the Self-Care Success System. And at Omekawa, we have an exclusive membership community and service called Oasis, where you can get personalized herbalist guidance for your body, wellness classes and workshops by holistic experts for your mind, and a community for your spirit of women that want to see you grow and thrive. Go to omekawa.com where you can take our free self-care success assessment and find out the five steps to build your core pillar and create a lifestyle you deserve. Welcome back. I am T. Erica with the feisty news for women. Girl, guess what? Walking away from a situation that you don't want to be in is sometimes the last thing you feel you should do, especially when people are watching you and judging you. But what have you did? In our next installment of The Feisty Life, we welcome Gabby to the stage. Gabby has a special skill that many would call being a loser. But guess what? Gabby managed to become an expert at being a loser and turn it into a full-time career. Hey, Gabby, you're not a loser. Tell us what you are. I am Gabby and I'm a quitter. I have had over a dozen jobs and been in probably eight different industries since I was 18 years old. I've quit a ton of different jobs, mostly because I just was beyond frustrated with not only the politics and the BS that goes on behind the scene, but just the fact that I can never fully expand it to my full potential. Like that's kind of what it came to. And so after being, you know, COVID hitting and everything that happened, I realized very quickly that I'm not gonna get what I want by being at these jobs and right trying to fit into those boxes. And so I kind of said YOLO and quit and had started to build a whole new life. So the Great Resignation is just this movement that's happening right now in the workforce where millions of people are fed up with their job, just like me, and they're quitting by the millions. And this is happening globally. So because of that, me documenting my journey of quitting my own job and kind of doing a, really helping people of learning how to do business, I've ended up creating a whole new career for myself, just sent it, centered around helping people quit their jobs. So my day-to-day -day looks like podcasting, I do content creation, I work with other people in consulting work, I work with brands and get paid four or five figure brand deals to work with brands that are reputable, that help people quit the nine to five. And I help other people quit the nine to five in the process as well. So it's just 
like been a phenomenal, phenomenal experience to not only empower myself while doing it, but also empower thousands of other women across the world doing the same exact thing. And so, you know, what my life looks like now is very, very different from my corporate job or even any of the jobs that I've had where, right, you wake up at a certain time and you're at a desk from nine to five and then you kind of carry on with your day. At this point now, I can travel when I want. I don't set an alarm clock. I really determine what my day looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So if it means I'm hanging by the pool midday while the sun is high, I do that. And if it means I'm taking a nap, that means I'm taking a nap. But the great thing is I get to set my own rules and no one tells me what to do, which was the hardest part for someone feisty like me. And honestly, I almost wish that I did it sooner, even if it's terrifying, because it's been the most exciting year I've ever had in my life. Thank you so much, Gabby, for teaching us that giving up has its privileges. I'm a quitter too, and I quit everything that does not bring joy into my life. Suffering isn't noble, it's self-abuse. We were meant to prosper, even we have to create the path to do so on our own. Moving right along. Remember last week when we celebrated International Women's Day on the 8th of March? All across social media, we saw reverence being shown to women. For one day, it was all about celebrating the ladies, and it was so nice until the next day, Variety Magazine posted a video interview with the most high social media queen, Kim Kardashian, and asked her for advice for women in business. This is what she said. I have the best advice for women in business. Get your ass up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. Uh. The backlash was swift all around the internet. Women were typing out their frustration. How dare she say that when she didn't work to get to where she is? She slept with Ray J. She shows her ass. She was born into a rich family. How dare she criticize us? Then the celebrity Jam Jamila Jamil got headlines for her reply. She said, I think if you grew up in Beverly Hills with super successful parents in what was simply a, a smaller mansion, nobody wants to hear your thoughts on success and work ethic. This same 24 hours in a day is a nightmare. 99.9% .9 of the world have a very different 24 hours. Yeah, whatever. Either Jamila wrote that to gain attention or she's not as savvy as I thought she was. Listen. It's so easy to lash out at the woman on top when they don't meet your standard of perfection. But if you are a woman on top, you would not have taken her words to heart the way so many did. When I heard Kim Kardashian's advice to women in business, the first thing I thought was, damn, her staff must have pissed her off and she decided to take that moment to vent. Why would I take her comment personally when I know for a fact that I'm working my ass off over here? It doesn't matter where Kim came from. What matters is that she is staying there. You can swim from the bottom of the pool to the top in any way you choose, but what happens next? Can you stay afloat? She's still on top, whether everyone is upset with her for a day or not. She wasn't trying to offend women. She was having an off moment, maybe because the women in her business that she owns were disappointing her. When you think of women in business, you might think of yourself. When she thinks of women in business, she doesn't think of other business women. She's thinking of the women who work for her. If you had a team of women working for you, you would probably be thinking the same thing she did because they are your concern and no one else. Why? Because you're focused on your own business. Women in business, your own business or other people's business. It's not her fault you don't get it. It was a miscalculated comment and she really didn't deserve all those headlines bashing her. But that's the price you pay for popularity, unfortunately. She didn't even respond or try to explain. The very next day, she waved her magic wand, posted a new picture to Instagram, and all the headlines about her changed. That's power. Thank you for watching the Feisty News for Women. I am T. Erica. Remember, be feisty. Women must be seen and heard. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty. Welcome to the feisty news.